Dr. Annalisa Bowen and I am in the College of Communication and Information Sciences and I'm here with Dr. Jackson Harris and we're talking about civil discourse. So Dr. Harris, first, what is Crossroads Civic Engagement Center and what is your role, what is its role in the University of Alabama? Yeah, sure. Crossroads Civic Engagement Center is an initiative of the Division of Community Affairs here at the University of Alabama. Our division is generally interested in improving the quality of life for folks in the state of Alabama. And our particular area of the division is interested in improving the quality of civic life. Obviously, that includes uh, civic discourse and stuff. So I'm uh, glad you invited us to talk about it today. It should be fun. Okay, so why do we care about civic discourse? What is that and what does that have to do with like discussions in the classroom? Yeah, I think when, mostly when we talk about civic discourse, what we're referring to is the way we interact as communities. And that's when I say civic, you can also think about as, as, that as communities. But the way we interact and communicate with one another, uh, the sort of possibilities we have for the sort of things we can talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think especially right now, a lot of the conversation is about what we feel or perceive as impossibilities when things become really difficult to converse about, um, particularly the more touchy subjects, which we spend a lot of our work here at Crossroads working through. Um, you know, that's what we mean by civic discourse. In the sort of system that we've got, in the sort of democratic uh, community that we've got, we have to be able to communicate about different things. And so that's why we also care about the sort of culture of discourse we have here on, on campus at UA and also in our online spaces that are affiliated with the university. And that goes all the way down to the sort of conversations, the sort of habits for discourse that we're creating and we're, we're building the skills for discourse that we're building within the classroom. So that's why not only do we care about discourse at a national and state level, but we also care a lot about the discourse that's happening in our classroom spaces online and also on campus. So what, what do you mean when you say like online discourse? Because mm -hmm. I know we have discussions. Yeah. How does that come into play? Yeah. Well, I think when we talk about discourse, traditionally we've, talk, we've thought about people sitting down like you and I mm -hmm. are. Uh, but as time has gone on and as, tech, and as digital technologies become more and more of the way we interact, uh, there's, seen, there's a little bit more space between things being shared and things being read, perceived, listened mm -hmm. to, and that sort of thing, which creates new opportunities for discourse. On the one hand, creates space for people to think through maybe what mm -hmm. they want to say and how they want to say it. Um, but it also builds in some anonymity, mm -hmm. which has not been traditionally a part of, of a lot of what we think of when we think about civic discourse and that sort of thing. So we're figuring this out as we go, as online learning becomes more and more of a part of what we do. Uh, the sort of skills necessary to make those conversations good, whether those are discussion posts or sharing uh, video chats with one another across an online space, um, we're figuring out how that may look different. But as Coach Bryant used to say, the same things win that always won. We just have a different <laughs> bunch of excuses when we lose. So it doesn't really matter whether it's an online space or an in-person space. Uh, it's still going to be important to share your perspective. That's going to add richness to any conversation we have about any topic. But it's also going to be even more important to listen to the perspectives of others and create spaces in which people feel like I can share what I say is going to be valuable mm -hmm. and people are going to appreciate it. Even if they don't agree with it, they're going to incorporate it into the way they view things. So what should I do if I read someone else's post um, or hear someone else's video chat and I'm like, that is not right. Yeah. That's actually incorrect. Yeah. Should I, should I just let it go? I mean, it's an online class or an, what should happen or yeah. should I challenge it? Yeah. I think part of the conversation that we try to start with is, um, in part based on, you know, what Stephen Covey said about beginning with the end in mind. The first mm -hmm. question we're going to ask ourselves is, and, and that we'll ask instructors and sort of things, what kind of discursive space what kind of conversation, rather, um, are you shooting for? What, mm -hmm. what are you trying to create here? Because if what we're trying to create, and I know over in the College of Communication and Information Sciences, a lot of great debaters, national champions <laughs> in, in a lot of cases, um, there may be cases in which the space we're trying to create is one in which there are winners and losers, mm -hmm. there are points to be scored, and so it may very well be that um, a certain type of rebuttal, a back and forth, is what we want to create. There are also some scenarios 
possibly in different classes, but certainly in community spaces in which the goal is to solve some sort of problem, mm -hmm. to come to some sort of agreement. So that might be what we call a, a deliberation or something like that. Um, we spend a lot of our time at Crossroads working with dialogue, um, which is a particular kind of conversation in which we're swapping personal narratives and personal life experiences in order to gain a better understanding of where people are coming from. All that to say, in most of our classes here at UA, online or in person, the kind of conversation we're trying to have is a discussion. Mm -hmm. A discussion is an interesting and uh, unique type, though we do it all the time. It's a specific type of conversation. And I like to think of it like if, um, imagine there was a house on a hill and everybody in the class was in a circle around the base of that hill. We're all looking at the same house mm -hmm. and it could be in your English class, it could be a reading, in your comm class, it could be research methods, it could, in your biology class, it could be what have you. But Everybody's seeing the same object, but from different points of view. In order for any person around that circle to get an impression of what the thing is mm -hmm. and all of its all of its exterior, but you know what have you, uh, we're going to have to communicate about that. Um, to your question about what should some, what should happen if someone says something you disagree with or whatever, I think probably three things need to be concentrated on if we're in the mode of discussion. Mm -hmm. um, one, have I listened, mm -hmm. and have I listened well? So that means. Have I given them the benefit of the doubt in some ways? And on those things that are they're really pushing me, have I asked some sort of follow-up question? Mm -hmm. um, have I created an opportunity for me to share? Mm -hmm. um, so if you feel like somebody said something and you really need them to know the way you view that house from where you're standing, mm -hmm. uh, have you created that sort of opportunity to do that? And then third, have I done both of those things in such a way that the conversation can continue? Mm -hmm. Now, in our classroom spaces, maybe we're only in this class for a semester length of time, in our community and social networks, more often than not, we're going to be connected with people for a longer period of time. And so it's not always just about doing the listening. It's not always just about doing the sharing. Um, but it's also about making sure those doors of communication stay open. And that can become really difficult sometimes. Um, but making sure that we're communicating with one another in which the conversation can keep going. Have I responded in a way that asks a follow-up question? Have I responded in such a way that lets the person know, I heard what you said, or I'm at least interested in your perspective. I'm also interested in you hearing another take on this or what mm -hmm. have you. That's easier said than done, obviously. But um, those are the sort of skills we're talking about when we talk about building the sort of skills necessary for a democratic society. What is a way that I might be able to avoid yeah. assumptions? Yeah. Well... Avoiding assumptions is kind of what we're after in general, I mean, in terms of, uh, of education, because the assumptions we carry into spaces, they don't only, they're not only limiting the kind of conversations we can have with people and the kind of relationships we can build with people, they're also limiting our ability to learn in general. Mm -hmm. I, I think that these days, um, changing your mind has kind of gotten a bad reputation, <laughs> and which I find interesting because... The changing of minds is really the purpose of education to begin with. If, if the mind you walk around with is the same on the day you get your diploma from mm. the University of Alabama as it was on your first day of orientation, then you have probably missed out on opportunity and we have probably not done our job <laughs> as educators around the university because even though we're not necessarily talking about changing your, your value system mm. or changing your positions on any type of big issue or something like that, the goal is to create a, a wider, a broader, more holistic knowledge of whatever the thing is. So recognizing that is um, challenging assumptions is absolutely important to do that. Um, it's, it's walking in and saying, while I think I have a handle on this, I'm here to learn what other people think about this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm here to challenge assumptions because that makes me a wiser person. That makes me a better community member, makes me a, a better friend, partner, what have you. And again, from our perspective at Crossroads, also makes us better civic participants in a democracy. So what I'm hearing you saying is if I want to challenge or if I disagree, yeah. I'm not attacking someone's yeah. values yeah. Um, and I'm not attacking their experience, but I can I can ask questions in a way that is kind yeah. and thoughtful. Sure. I think a lot of us feel like we have the responsibility to... Um, in, in discursive experiences right now that we have the responsibility to make sure other people know where we're coming from and what our values are and what our fears and that sort of thing. And while that's really tricky to do, 
uh, in a way that keeps the doors open, that is important. So here's what we would recommend from Crossroads is what we refer to as kind of a feet first approach to these mm -hmm. conversations. Starting at the feet and where your feet are, asking yourself the question, is this the right time and place for this conversation that I'm about to have or that this person has, has started? Are we starting off on the right foot? Are there power differences that might need to be considered? Obviously, you're going to talk to your friend and peer differently than you might to someone who's in administration or your mm -hmm. instructor in a class. And so all those things need to be figured out before we launch directly into the tumultuous waters <laughs> of, of difficult conversations and civic discourse. But let's say we've d decided, you know, this is the time and place. As I just mentioned, this is what school is for. Mm -hmm. We want to have these sorts of discussions. I've decided, starting with my feet, that's good. The next thing, kind of working from the bottom up, is to ask ourselves the hard questions and ask our, our partner the hard questions. Um, things like, what are your fears associated with this? You seem to care about this a lot. What are your fears associated with this? Because I know that I have a lot of fears associated mm -hmm. with this. Similarly, I've got a lot of hopes associated with this. You know, a lot, This is a really passion-oriented passion thing for me. Um, in what ways is this connected to your passion? So ask the heart questions first, mm -hmm. because those are going to allow you the possibility to continue the conversation and eventually get to the head question, the brain questions of, what do you think should be done about this? Is there a problem here that needs to be solved? What are the action steps or whatever? Uh, too often, I think because of the way our culture has kind of built up these habits, our first um, hunch is that we need to jump in head first. Mm -hmm. And we immediately start doing these talking points. And we immediately <laughs> start talking about policy positions mm -hmm. on issues that are really hard things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we're having conversations in the wrong place and at the wrong time. Mm -hmm in such a way that there's no way that conversation can go well because we've started off, as it were, on the wrong foot. Um, so anyway, that's what we recommend, and we find that that works pretty well. Do you think that this approach applies to discussions, say, in a class, yeah. online or face-to-face, -face, where it's not really, like, a problem? Like, I'm just sharing something that's related to the module or the topic, mm -hmm and I'm trying to use facts, is there still a place for discussion? And how, how can we engage um, when maybe we don't care? Yeah. I think that's really interesting. It, uh, if the question is, can I still get a good grade, <laughs> then that's probably a question between you and your course instructor. If the question is, what's the best way for me to learn and mm -hmm. get the most out of this experience, then the answer is going to be, I'm in this online class or in this in-person class even with other people. Again, challenging our assumptions that we already know as much as there is to know. Or even the assumption that the only way we can learn about the subject is from the textbook or the required readings. Mm. Then we have severely limited our ability to grow our understanding of that topic because there's all these other people who have a different set of eyes, a different set of ears, a different set of lived experiences who can inform our knowledge of that. If you're here to learn, then a huge component of that is not just the books, it's not just the readings or the YouTube videos or whatever that you're asked to read. It is learning from the people who are in those learning spaces mm -hmm. with you. If you're here just to pass or what have you, then that's up to you. But I'm, I'm a big proponent of uh, return on investment. Mm -hmm. And if you're spending the time, the energy, and even the cash money <laughs> to get a diploma, take advantage of the opportunity to challenge your assumptions, to listen, to create a space in which you can share and others feel encouraged and invited to share as well. So... Last question, what would be your biggest recommendation for someone, okay, two parts. <laughs> what would be your biggest recommendation for the student, and let's go with instructor as well, who feels a little nervous yeah. participating in a discussion? So you've given me some good yeah. ideas, but I'm a little scared. Yeah. And then what would you say your biggest recommendation is for the instructor or um students who feel like, I got this, yeah. like, you, I already know all of this. Yeah, okay. Let me start with the second question is, one thing uh, that we've learned is a delicate balance for everybody, and we run into this all the time. I consider myself on a personal growth journey for having mm -hmm. good conversation stuff. It's something we always try to get better at. Um, but I think you're right, because we're talking about things that people have been doing since they, uh, you know, probably kindergarten for <laughs> most of us, which is sharing and learning how to listen. We think we've got it. Mm -hmm. And yet, also, we know that nobody around us seems to know to do it. So a little bit of humility <laughs> knows that, well, if nobody else seems to be sharing and listening well, then we might also not share this well. So it is something to, to revisit and, and push ourselves to think, 
even if we feel really confident about sharing and our ability to share and express ourselves, it's worth knowing that that can often backfire. Mm. If we're sharing so much or in a certain type of way that nobody around us um, feels like they can share, uh, then we have not positively contributed to a culture of discourse in that classroom or elsewhere. So similarly, if we think we're really good at listening, but we're contributing to a culture in which nobody shares anything, then that also is not the end goal that we're after. So mm-hmm. finding that balance is a lot more difficult than it sounds for a lot of us. Um, and for me personally, in an online class or in a Zoom class or something like that, I know I'm more likely to share than not. So I just keep a tally. Mm-hmm. How many times have I shared my perspectives and then kind of get a sense of how much is everybody else sharing? And if my tallies are, are way above everybody else's, that's a sign that I'm probably not listening enough. Mm-hmm. Similarly, if I'm getting towards the edge of class and I don't have any tallies on my sheet, I should probably ask myself, what meaningful thing might I have to share? Mm. And might, could I put some thoughts together that, that other people would be interested in hearing? Um, now, the first part of your question was, what if we're scared and we want to dip our toe into these waters that we know are tumultuous <laughs> and we don't know what sort of rocks might be under mm. the surface and that sort of thing that could be harmful? Uh, then again, we kind of go back to the, the feet first method, the same way that scuba divers jump in off the boat. They don't dive head first. They just jump in feet first so that if they hit something they weren't expecting, they're OK. Uh, similarly, if you want to have these sorts of conversations in a classroom environment and you know that it might be treacherous, mm-hmm. whatever the topic is, make sure you're starting off the right way. Because the way we start those conversations, the way we set expectations for a course on syllabus day, as mm-hmm. it's called or whatever, I think it should be called discussion expectations day. But uh, uh, the way we start that creates opportunities and limitations for the sort of interactions that can happen. Mm-hmm. Can you undo and revise that later throughout the semester? Yes, but it's much more difficult. One way to think about this might be like we think about a football team that puts their playbook together and, and develops their offense in the offseason, in spring training and in fall camp. And the playbook's there. We've decided what we're going to do. And you kind of run with that for the season. And you hope it works out. Now, if you're midseason and you're only three and six, then it's probably worth <laughs> revisiting what that offense mm-hmm. is and making those changes then. But as any football coach, I'm sure, would tell you, it's much easier to make those changes on the front end uh, than trying to make those changes midseason. And the same thing seems to be true for our courses and the sort of discussion culture that we build. Mm-hmm. Can you change that mid-semester and, and make some changes to the expectations and that sort of thing uh, that might help you end the season on a high note? Yes, you can. But um, what we recommend is make sure you're putting the effort there on the front end mm-hmm. at the beginning of the class, at the beginning of each class, then returning to what sort of environment, what sort of exchange are we trying to create, and then what are the responsibilities of each of us, instructor and students alike, to make that sort of conversation, that discursive experience, uh, a reality. Okay, so I have actually two more questions. <laughs> so what what would you guys recommend if I feel like I've messed up, yeah. what, what happens, what should I do to correct if I've made a statement, say in a discussion, whether it's written, whether it's oral, um, or if I, if I read something and I think, well, that, that wasn't very yeah. <laughs> um, civic engagement yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What, what should I do? This comes up pretty frequently in a lot of the dialogue work that we do because we're specifically trying to create spaces to talk about the most difficult issues in our national conversation, Mm -hmm. right? And this could be uh, gun legislation or abortion or Confederate monuments, a whole host of things that people generally don't touch with a 10-foot pole Mm -hmm. because it's so difficult to have those conversations well. And one of the expectations that we set in those spaces is what we refer to as an oops-ouch rule. You call it (laughs) what you want to in your class, but it works pretty well for us is so many of us think as we talk, I'm one of these people, uh, that it's possible we'll say something that pretty soon after we say it, we think, oops, I, that's not how I, I can see already that I just expressed it in a way that I didn't mean to, mm. whatever I was trying to get at. The flip side of that is the ouch part. So if somebody has said something and, and for the sake of the discourse and keeping the conversation going, you need to let them know, mm. hey, one of the things you just said I just got to let you know I had a little ouch there. Mm. Again, you call it what you want. (laughs) um, But in that spirit and say, I want you to know I'm still listening to you. I'm Mm. really interested in what you have to say. But the way you said that last thing made me think this. And Mm. so, you know, just wanted to let you know that. That that has now created an opportunity for that person to, one, learn, Mm. to apologize. It keeps the conversation going. And if they don't quite understand to the point that they feel like apologizing, then it at least keeps the conversation open. Y'all can continue to go back and forth. 
I understand that your intentions might not have been the impact. I, mm. I'm letting you know now that the the way that came across was this, and I'm wondering, mm. uh, tell me more about that. Mm. You know, what? How did you come to that perspective? Um, you know, what do you think is being misunderstood here mm. to help you know get on the same page? Because um, again, the end goal is to keep the conversation going and to keep the learning going. Okay, so now, 100% final question. <laughs> I want to learn more. Yeah. Can what? What, what what do I do to get involved or hear more or further my understanding from Crossroads? Well, we keep a lot of resources on a page of our website, which is crossroads.ua.edu. Um, from time to time, we try to keep the conversation going on uh, on Instagram, mm-hmm. which is our handle is ua underscore crossroads. And so we'll post things about uh, campus discourse and that sort of thing on there. Um, also, come by and see us. Our student center... Uh, has a whole bunch of different stuff, including the post office, the Starbucks, <laughs> and the uh, food court, but also has Crossroads Civic mm-hmm. Engagement Center, which is where we are now. We're on the third floor. And we'd love to talk to any students or instructors who are interested in helping us um, create a culture of civic engagement and healthy civic discourse on campus. And we want to know if there are ways we can support you all in those efforts. Like I say, either students, instructors, staff, whoever, um, we want to be a part of that success because it's important to not just us, but the university as a whole to be the kind of place where people are graduating as more encouraged Mm -hmm. and skilled community and democratic participants than when they got here on day one. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Well, thank you, Dr. Bowling. (laughs) Thanks. Cool. (laughs)